as writers and actors fight not just for a fair piece of the pie, but for what they feel is their survival in Hollywood going forward, not only has the production pipeline been ground to a halt, but the awards season is being deeply affected. Let's discuss. So even though these, this, the two strikes, there are two strikes, the writers and the actors, and both have to be resolved independently. Uh, while we're not quite sure what the timetable is going to be, there's been a little movement with the writers. This could take, I hear that some people in Hollywood feel it could take through the rest of the year. Uh, and that puts a number of awards contenders in limbo as stars can't promote the films or, you know, like that would come out down later down the line, closer to the end of the year. But starting now, there's the very important fall film festival circuit, uh, Venice, uh, Toronto, New York, uh, which is part of the trail to award season. And it's very important to be there. But because of the strikes, it would seem, you know, that the actors won't be able to be there. So some movies are, you know, deciding to wait out till next year. Challengers already already pulled out for 2024, and Warner Brothers might move Dune 2 and or The Color Purple. Will any other movies blink, hightailing it to 2024, or will they stay and risk it, trying to take advantage, and this is where things get really interesting, of what might be a wide open award season because of lack of competition? Ooh, let's discuss. We're gonna go, this is a very early Oscar breakdown. Things can change dramatically as we get closer to the actual awards in 2024. Uh, but we're gonna focus on the current front runners, the solid contenders, some dark horse candidates, and then some movies that surprisingly don't seem to have a prayer, that are already out of the race. All right, so let's talk front runners. And of course, Barbenheimer. Just as Barbenheimer is dominating the box office, it seems that friendly competition could continue to award season. Uh, well, um, many Oppenheimer fans, by the way, one of the, the solace they've taken is that while Barbie might have sold tickets, more, more, more tickets, Christopher Nolan's film is the superior one, right? Uh, with Oppenheimer fans convinced that it will trounce Barbie when it comes to noms and certainly wins. But we shall see. I think it's going to be a closer race than you would think. Both are best picture and screenplay contenders. With Margo, and then with acting, Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, Killian Murphy, and Robert Downey Jr. are all considered front runners. Uh, but interestingly, while Nolan is considered to, a front runner to be nominated for director, Greta Gerwig is not. How can that be? Well, there are a lot of female directors who are getting attention this year, and Hollywood might feel that Greta Gerwig's reward is being the first woman to solely direct a billion dollar picture. And as of late, the most successful, it's certainly the most successful live action film, and we'll see if it becomes the most successful film live action or animated directed by a woman. But you know, that's quite the feather in the cap already. And the Academy might choose, because their films aren't going to do as well, uh, to nominate Emerald Fennell uh, and or Celine Song instead for their smaller films. But I think that Greta Gerwig has such an incredible accomplishment here, how could she not be nominated? I mean, it would seem to me almost like being punished for her success. Uh, so it's interesting, you know, it's wildly, you know, it's what a real roller coaster with women being nominated in the director's category. It's usually always white men, uh, but every, you know, every other year or so we get a, a, a nice little surprise. But this year there are a lot of women competing in this category, so not all of them are going to be able to make it in. It would be nice if they did. Three women and two men, maybe. Right, right, right. But we'll see. And naturally, Barbie is the movie to beat when it comes to production design, costume design. Make, uh, some, by the way, some of you might be like, well, wouldn't that be unfair? Shouldn't we nominate the best person for the job when it comes to directing? How do you know it's not three women in the category? That's the whole problem with that best person for the job argument, because it always seems to be one type of best person. All right, so anyway. Back to Barbie. Barbie is certainly the movie to beat when it comes to production design, costume design, makeup and hairstyling, and maybe even best song. Yes, people are getting excited that it might be I'm Just Ken versus Peaches in the best song category. Interestingly, two, two very similar ballads about unrequented love. But while only one can win the Oscar, and I would love it to be I'm Just Ken, but the real winners will be the viewers and the ceremony itself because both Ryan Gosling and Jack, uh, Ryan Gosling and Jack Black would get to perform live at the Oscars, and that would be incredible. That would be really great. It would certainly help with ratings. 
Beyond Barbenheimer, there are a lot of other movies that hardly anyone, if anyone, has seen yet because award season typically starts in the fall, after Labor Day. It's rare for summer movies to get awards traction, much less win. Uh, so that's why it's so remarkable when they do. Barbenheimer is very special. Everything Everywhere All at Once came out earlier, uh, but it is still unusual. But this is an unusual year, and again, a very wide open year because it seems like the lack of competition. And again, some of these movies still might move. Uh, Martin Scorsese, of course, is in the mix with Killers of the Flower Moon. It has an all-star cast, and it tells a horrible true story forgotten by history, yet still incredibly timely today. But that leads me to question as to whether or not Killers of the Flower Moon might be too political. Uh, it's going to be very political. That's going to be a lightning rod discussion. Uh, also, maybe it's too much of the same old, same old. Maybe the Oscars will feel they've already covered that territory as well as it, you know, Martin Scorsese might do. And Barbenheimer and maybe even some other movies might seem more fresh, right? Something to reward something different. We'll see. But when it comes to Killers of the Flower Moon, the reviews out of Cannes were quite good, which is a rarity these days. So that speaks well for that movie's Oscar chances. Uh, some other movies that have really excited the awards circuit uh, so far are from two from Netflix. Netflix is really trying to get a Best Picture Oscar. Apple TV beat them to it. Uh, Netflix has come close, but Apple TV was the first streamer to get it. Uh, but that doesn't mean Netflix has given up, given up the dream. Bradley Cooper's Maestro, uh, whose um, Maestro, whose uh, trailer just recently came out, is predicted to be a huge contender. Like wow. This movie is about the famous composer Leonard Bernstein uh, focusing on his marriage to a woman, but also his double life as a gay man, uh, made even more complicated by the fact that he was a public figure in the 1940s and 50s. Now, this film is produced by Scorsese as well, and Steven Spielberg, and uh, Bradley Cooper's longtime collaborator, Todd Phillips. Bradley Cooper was involved behind the camera on Joker. So that is quite a dream team to promote the film on the awards campaign. And none of those are, none of that group is actors, so maybe they, they wouldn't be hindered from doing so. So I think that uh, um, Maestro could really compete with Oppenheimer because they're very similar films. They're both really strong prestige dramas, which are very visually striking, and they're biographies about legendary men persecuted for not fitting the norm. So that's Oppenheimer's, I think, true competition opposite uh, Barbie. Because, uh, you know, I think they're going to, you know, they let, the awards are very, they like to have balance. They like to celebrate a number of different films. And so, um, you know, I think Oppenheimer and Maestro, it's hard to celebrate both those movies because it seems repetitive. So you might see one break out, see one break out opposite the other. Netflix has another movie made December with Todd Haynes reuniting with Julianne Moore while adding Natalie Portman to the mix. Here, Moore plays a woman who had an affair and married a man much younger than her. This is uh, based on, you know, the famous, uh, the infamous scandal. And then this movie is about how years later, Portman plays an actress who is going to portray Moore's character in a movie. So she goes to visit that family today and research Moore's role and things get weird. You know, maybe Challengers is right to move because speaking of dualities, this seems like there might be a duality there. And then there's A24's Past Lives, which follows uh, in a recent line of Korean films, Korean stories. I think this is an American production, but it tells a partial Korean story that have gotten significant Oscar traction and in some case wins. Past Lives has very strong traction. In fact, it is expected to be nominated in almost every single major category. So this is definitely a film to pay attention to when it comes to awards season. Now, before we get to some of the more some of the less hopeful uh, films, let's talk about animation. And there is a lot of chatter that across the Spider-Verse might be able to break into the actual best picture category. And not talking about best animated feature, best picture as an animated movie, which is a very small club indeed. That would be incredible. Uh, Spider-Verse is certainly the front runner to win best animated feature. And per usual, Disney's two divisions are expected to get nominated as well with Elemental and Wish. But will they? Strong competition here. Super Mario Brothers, Nimona from Netflix, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles all have a pretty strong claim. Super Mario Brothers is a colossal hit, which you would think at least deserves a nomination. That's particularly how animation has worked in the past as a category, unlike other categories. 
Nimona offers up not only important LGBT, LGBT representation, but what a story. Disney dumped the film because of that representation, and Netflix saved it, and it turned out really well. And Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is from director Jeff Rowe, whose Mitchells vs. the Machines has already been nominated. So Academy voters have a relationship with him and might want to continue to, you know, you know, make sure his career goes well. So one of those two Disney movies might not make it, interestingly enough. The Holdovers, speaking of Oppenheimer, The Holdovers dropped a really charming trailer in front of that movie. But is the reason that nobody's really talked about this film because Alexander Payne is still haunted by that horrible scandal from a few years ago, which never really got resolved? Saltburn is suddenly starting to get a lot of traction. Uh, Emerald Fennel's follow-up to Promising Young Woman, which got a lot of nominations, but not any wins. It's so horrible. It's such, I th Emerald Fennel, I think, actually. Did she win, right? But that movie, I think, deserved more attention than it got. But there are a lot of Emerald Fennel fans now, myself included. And by the way, a Promising Young Woman, Saltburn, and Barbie are all produced by Margot Robbie. In fact, Fennel herself has a cameo in Barbie. But what's with Margot Robbie creating friendly competition for herself this year? Could Saltburn, speaking of dualities, could Saltburn steal some of Barbie's Oscar thunder, especially in the director and screenplay categories, with Barbie getting all the money? So let's go and reward Saltburn uh, when it comes to awards. That could definitely happen. Then before he donned the cowl, Ben Affleck had turned himself, well, he started out as an Oscar winner, but then he had been able to rehabilitate his career, rehabilitate his career to become a huge Oscar darling. I mean, that's the thing that got him into the comic book movies. You know, he was riding high. And now he's trying to return, after a rough time there, with Air. Now, this film is considered a bit of a wild card in categories overall, but Viola Davis is considered a frontrunner for Best Supporting Actress. Not only because she did an incredible job and a great, an important role, but also sadly because the female categories are typically hard to fill year to year, and so therefore a little less competitive. Every year this happens, it's so annoying. Uh, and speaking of actresses, America Ferreira is expected to get nominated for Dumb Money, not for Barbie, although her role, her monologue in Barbie ended up being such a big deal, it could end up being the other way around after all. But what could happen is that she gets nominated for Dumb Money, but rides the wave of her Barbie monologue anyway, a perfect one-two punch that gets her the Oscar. It's like how True Detective aired during voting season. So even though Matthew McConaughey technically won for Dallas Buyers Club, he also kind of won for True Detective. So I could see that happening for America Ferreira. Great timing on the part of her team. Unless Dumb Money somehow gets delayed. I don't think Dumb Money will. I think Dumb Money's going to open. And come on, can we get Glenn Howerton nominated for Blackberry? Dude hasn't gotten any work off of the film. Let's at least give him a nomination. Come on. And it could happen because a lot of people in the industry have seen the film. But unfortunately, to get nominated, you need a big aggressive awards campaign behind you. And Elevation Pictures don't has, doesn't have the money or pull to run such a campaign. So Glenn Howerton would have to, I don't know, or his agency would have to somehow try to do this themselves. But you don't want to pull an Andrew Riseborough, Glenn. You got to be careful. But boy, he was good in Blackberry. He deserves to be nominated. Although unfortunately, the male categories are extremely competitive. Uh, and so he might not make it in. Finally, despite the favorite being an awards juggernaut, Emma Stone and Yorgos Lanthimos' new movie is struggling to get awards traction, but at least it's still part of the conversation, whereas some other movies can't even say that. Napoleon doesn't seem to have any buzz, despite not only Ridley Scott directing and the movie looking, looking incredible, and awards loving biographies, historical biographies, uh, but, you know, and also Oscar, recent Oscar winner Joaquin Phoenix in the lead role. You think Napoleon would be a big part of the awards conversation, but it is not. And nobody's talking about Michael Mann's Ferrari starring Adam Driver. Did House of Gucci do even more damage than we thought? You know, it certainly hurt Lady Gaga and Jared Leto, but it might have hurt Adam Driver, too. Uh, which is a shame. It's, I don't think it's any of the actors' fault. It was really, that, that, that movie really had a problem because of the script. It totally fell apart after the first half. But Neon is distributing Ferrari, and Neon, they have a, they have a pretty strong uh, awards Rolodex. They know what they're doing. They've managed to get some noms, but also some wins for their films in the past, including freaking Parasite. So Neon has the connections, but they better get started on Ferrari. No buzz. The only thing I can think that maybe they might move it if they haven't started to try and get anyone talking about it just yet. Or maybe they're biding their time. Maybe they don't want to peak too early. And We are still a couple of months out. And also, it's worth noting that the awards circuit has totally passed over, forgotten, Wes Anderson's Asteroid City, 
and Ari Aster's Beau is Afraid. Not to say they can't maybe pick up some production design and hair and makeup and costume awards, right? But are these the mother for the, those respective directors? Although Aronofsky rallied again with The Whale after that, which got three Oscar nominations and won two of them, including Best Actor for Brendan Fraser. Because hey, Hollywood always will love a comeback story. So those two directors, Wes Anderson and Ari Aster, are definitely down, but they're not out. Uh, so what do you think of the Oscar race so far? Are there any movies that you're rooting for in particular? Are there any movies you're rooting against? And do you think I've left any contenders or possible contenders out of the conversation? And do you think any movies will move? And would you move your movie? Or would you stay in it considering how wide open the field seems? And do you think it will be again all about Barbenheimer? Share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.